Oh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our service, and special welcome to John. Come and take our service this evening. It's good to see you. Thank you. Services as we continue on Monday night, young adults group, eight o'clock at Beth and Will's house, and then on Tuesday, Bible study at seven thirty. If you want to read ahead, Ephesians chapter two, verse one to ten, and they are amazing verses. So let's pray that God will speak to us on Tuesday night for those verses. Wednesday morning, 10 o'clock coffee morning, and 5.30 and 6.30, the clubs will resume with the children, and we're back in school term time again. And next Sunday morning begins at 10.15 with a prayer meeting. 11 o'clock, family service with Derek French, and Robert Scriven will take the evening service at 6.30. Your prayers this week, continue to remember Bible studies in the prison Monday afternoon. And can you remember those at the church here at the moment struggle with various health issues. Terry had a bit of a fall on Wednesday last week, and I feel a bit sore and bruised. That's great for Terry, especially this time. This afternoon. Yes. Mm. And also, just remember Anne as well. None of us from the church as well need our prayers and support this time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Russ, for your welcome. Good to be back and to see you all again and to join in your evening service. Somebody put up on my Facebook page the other day that uh, there was a link there that I could uh, download that link and it would count down to Christmas day by day. <laughs> so that was extraordinary. I enjoy Christmas. Um, I enjoy the build-up to it. Uh, and I enjoy the Christmas songs. I'm sure you do as well. Uh, but uh, I must say at Christmas, there comes a point when I get to Christmas Eve and Christmas Day and I think, well, I, actually, these songs are lovely, but I've had enough of them, and it's good to move on. I don't know if you feel the same. I say that because, of course, we've just had Easter, and Easter just seems to come and go so quickly. So our songs tonight, forgive me, I've chosen, they're all Easter songs, and I thought it would be good to remind us of this great Christian theme. First one we know well, thine be the glory, risen, conquering, Savior. It's in the books, it's 281. Let's join together, stand and sing, 281, Thine Be the Glory.
Father, we come to your presence tonight in and through the name of Jesus, and we thank you that we have a risen, living Savior. We thank you that Jesus has conquered death, that he rose from the grave on the third day. Father, we thank you that before that, that dreadful event happened on Good Friday, <coughs> when people took the Son of God and nailed him to a cross. Mm -hmm. Father, it must have seemed so futile at the sign. It must have felt like the end. And yet we know that Jesus was accomplishing something really tremendous. He was opening up the way for men and women like us to get to know God for ourselves. We thank you that what he did on that cross was effective. We thank you that what he cried on the cross was absolutely true when he said, it is finished. Mm -hmm. We thank you that Jesus did everything that was needed for us to know you. Father, we thank you for your goodness towards us. And Lord, as we pray this evening, we seek your blessing on our time together. We thank you that you're here in this service. We pray for those who cannot be with us tonight. We think of Terry, who's unwell after that fall. We pray that you will be with him and help and heal him, settle him down. We remember Anne, who's been very ill in a hospital, and we ask that you will draw near to her and restore her to full health and strength. Lord, we pray for Jim as tomorrow he goes into the guy's prison, and we pray that he will have a good time with the group of people from that place, and we pray, Lord, that those men in prison may discover what it is to be set free by Jesus. Come into that place week by week, we pray. Spirit of God, reveal Jesus to those people. Give Jim great wisdom and use him that he may not only help those people, but that he too may point them to Jesus. Father, we think of the world at this time. We remember the war in Ukraine and we long for peace. We remember, Lord, those still suffering as a result of that dreadful earthquake in Turkey, spreading out into Syria as well. And Lord, we pray for those poor people who have been rendered homeless and lost everything. Help them, we pray, Lord God. We thank you that many Christian people have engaged with that. We pray that you will help the church members from that region rebuild their churches, numbers, one by one, we pray, Lord God. And we pray, Lord, that you will guide in the use of resources that the help may be maximized and that as quickly as possible those people may be restored. Help them and bless them, we pray. And Father, we pray for those areas of the world where there is drought, we think especially of Kenya, and we pray that you will help people there. We thank you for farming projects, many Christian farming projects, being used to help people withstand the drought more and more. Help them, we pray, Lord, and as people learn how to farm your way, I pray that they may get to know you for themselves as well. Mm -hmm. Father, we pray for Waris and for Parveen and their children. Meet their needs and the monthly food parcels that this company of believers provides. Use them to bless that family, we pray. And Lord, we think of ourselves, and some of us here tonight are feeling quite burdened. Maybe some are feeling unwell. We think of Carol, Lord, with her ongoing aches and pains. Look after her. But Lord, our own problems, we bring them to you now. Thankful that you're a God who does hear prayer, that you're a God who does answer prayer. We seek your help, your encouragement, and your blessing. Speak to us this evening, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I was thinking of a Bible verse, 1 Timothy 4.16, and it begins with these words. It says, watch your life and doctrine closely. <coughs> watch your life and doctrine closely. Uh, I recently have uh, three people that I know have, have died, and uh, they were in different ways people quite outstanding in the way they lived their lives as Christian people for God, watching their life and their doctrine closely. One died on Friday, you may have heard the name George Verber, 
George Verver was the founder of OM, Operation Mobilization, a tremendous organization which has mobilized thousands of young people uh, and inspired them. Uh, and actually, through George Verver's work, uh, there have been a succession of ships. Uh, there is Logos Hope now, a big ship, and there is a new one about to be commissioned, commissioned called Julos Hope. And as well as that, out of people who have worked inspired by George Verver, working with George Verver on Operation Mobilization, there are more than 300 Christian organizations have been formed. One, for example, is Sat7, the big television work that goes on across the Middle East. And George became unwell at Christmas and New Year, and in February it was announced that he had a very active cancer, uh, and on Friday he went to be with the Lord. A great man of God who did done extraordinary things. Again, on my Facebook pages, lots of people are, are aligning themselves with George. George kept in touch, I should think, with thousands of people. Uh, and myself included. I don't know why he was as kind and as gracious as that. Once in a blue moon, my phone would ring, hello, John, George here, how are you doing? And we would have a chat together. Lovely man of God, inspirational man of God. A man who watched his life and his doctrine. On Tuesday, I shall be at a service Tuesday afternoon when we will sing that hymn that we've just sung together again. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, he was 89, he was about 10 days off his 90th birthday, Leonard Jones, a, a, a Welshman, very Welsh, uh, and he'd been a pastor in, in South Wales, in Pembrokeshire at one stage, Barry Island. Uh, a, a lovely man who served God so well, a, a man with a twinkle in his eye, a man who was a lot of fun, he told me that when he was in Barry Island as the pastor there, he was a uh, chaplain to the docks. Uh, and he went into the docks one day and there was a big cargo ship at the side and he climbed up the ladder and it turned out to be a Russian ship. Uh, and the captain met him at the top of the ladder uh, and said, you will come with me to my cabin. So to, uh, well, Leonard went to his cabin uh, and uh, the captain said, you will drink with me now. <laughs> so Leonard said, all right. And the captain poured him out a huge glass of vodka. <laughs> and Leonard wasn't used to that at all. He said, how I got back down that ladder, I shall never know. But he did. <laughs> and he was a great man, a pastor in big, big churches. Uh, the church he grew up in uh, after the Welsh revival you know, over 100 years ago uh, received 600 new people and accommodated them easily. The buildings were that big. Uh, and Leonard was a man, another man of God who watched his life and doctrine closely. George Verva, in one form of Christian ministry. Leonard in another. <clears throat> Third person I'm thinking of is my cousin. She died uh, on March the 4th, February the 4th. And she was 91, my cousin Janet. And, uh, you know, I, I've been a pastor. And one of the things that's made me sad over the years is when people get, you know, to that sort of age, and really should be honored for who they are, very few people turn up to their funeral. They've outlived them all. Uh, and, and that's the way it works. My cousin Janet had over 200 people at her funeral. She was just a farmer's wife, and she was a Christian. And she was so kind and so loving. Uh, and uh, I just had a brief word at the, at, the, at the funeral, and I said to people, would you just raise your hand, please? It's, this is not a trick question. I'm not asking you. No, I'm ask, I asked them. I said, if, if Janet ever gave you some fresh cream or half a dozen eggs, two thirds of the hands went up. Uh, and I said to the people there, well, we all know how to get a good lot of people at our funeral now, don't we? <laughs> Give them all eggs and, and cream. And that was my cousin Janet. But she prayed, and, and one of the people who shared in the service said, I wouldn't be surprised if Janet hadn't prayed for all of us. Just a quiet Christian woman. Mm -hmm. George Verver, thank God for the George Ververs. Leonard Jones, thank God for the pastors and the great work they do. You can do a great work for God mm -hmm. as a farmer's wife or as whatever you are here in Froome. Watch your life and your doctrine closely and do it all for God and for his glory. We're going to come to the cross and we're going to sing about the cross. We're going to sing 236. Always chastening, salutary, to think of Calvary. And this tells the story so well. Come and see.
Come and see, come and see the King of Love. See the purple robe and crown of thorns he wears. Let this take you through the story of Good Friday morning. Good Friday, as it just unfolded, there it is. 236, let's stand up to see. I haven't ever sung this one before, so I'll play it all the way through. <coughs> okay. Just for a benefit for people who don't know the tune, all right? Good, thank you, Ross. <laughs> chapter 1, but you might like to turn to chapter 3, because I'm just going to do one verse in chapter 1. What's Romans about? In Romans 1.16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Uh, and English 
word that we words that we could use substitute there is the good news. The gospel is good news. I'm not ashamed of the good news. Mm -hmm. It is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. And as we go on into the next remainder of that chapter and chapter two and start of chapter three, Paul shows us why we need good news. Because the world's in a mess. And it's bad news. And it really is quite depressing. And it is really very relevant to today. But as we come into chapter 3, verse 21, Paul says this. Now, apart, but now, and, and those two words are a real turning point. There's lots of bad news. But now, he says, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So we've all sinned, and yet God has worked by his grace, and there's a big change. We're justified freely through the redemption, by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Chapter 5, verse 1. And I want to read the first five verses, and these are mainly what I'm going to talk about tonight. Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, we, we also glory in our sufferings. We know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us it does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. I want to unpack those five verses this evening. They are really, they are a little complicated perhaps, but they are really tremendously good news. And that's what I want us to think about in a moment or two. Before we do so, let's sing 242. 242. Here is love vast as the ocean. Loving kindness as the flood, when the Prince of Life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. 242. <laughs> Sundays, but I would basically go to church because my parents said, you will go to church. I had no excuse, and so I jolly well had to go. It was just how it was. Uh, I have to say that when I went in that phase, I was extremely bored, and I really began, began to get quite perceptive to the themes that they kept banging on about. And I have to say, too, that one of the themes in that particular church that they kept banging on and on about was sin. Uh, and actually the services on the Sunday evening were supposed to be designed for non-Christians and we wanted to give them a warm welcome and make them feel comfortable and make them feel at home. And every Sunday evening I would go along to church with mum and dad and again they would bang on and on about sin, sin, sin. Oh, it really did make you feel down in the, in the mouth. It really got to you. It made you depressed. 
And I found that I would look in my Bible and I was reading parts of the Bible at that time and one day I came across a Bible verse and I thought, I bet one Sunday night I'm going to come here and somebody is going to preach on this verse. Job 25 and verse 6 and Job 25 and verse 6 says speaks of mankind and it says, who is but a maggot? I thought that would be great in this context. We're all feeling bad enough already. Let's all feel like maggots as well. Just to make the point, it goes on, drives it home. Who is only a worm? Great. Sunday evenings, off I would go, and I would wait. Nobody ever did it. But I thought they would one day, sooner or later, preach on that verse. Man who is but a maggot, who is only a worm? Oh, my dear, it was so depressing. And I came to the conclusion, come on, guys. As Christians, we're supposed to be talking about good news. And here we are telling people, you're maggots and you're worms. It just didn't seem to add up to me. And I don't know, maybe you've got the same feeling. And maybe you've even walked in tonight thinking, well, I feel a bit of a maggot, to be honest. I feel a bit of a worm. I want you to know that in the Bible, the gospel, as it's called frequently, and as I said, the English translation of those Anglo-Saxon words is good news. The message that we've got, the good news, really is good. And that's what I want to try and get over to you this evening. Now, what is it, this message that is good news? Paul is talking about it all through this book. This is one of the longer books of the New Testament, and it's one of the more complicated books of the New Testament. Basically, what Paul is trying to explain in great detail, and it's the detail that makes it so long, what he's trying to explain is... <laughs> Good news. And I want you to understand that it's good news. But what is this basic good news? Well, it begins with God. And the God of the Bible, he's real. The God of the Bible exists. The God of the Bible is a God who is loving, he is kind, he is gracious, and he cares for people like you and like me. I take a chance here, but I presume that you live in this world. The Bible says famously in John 3 and verse 16, God loved the world so much. And if you are a citizen of this world, then that's who it's talking about. And it's saying, God loved you so much. And that's great, we're off to a good start. But we hit a problem. It starts off in a positive way. The truth is that the God of the Bible is morally pure. He's upright. He's just. He's totally trustworthy. Oh, truth part one. Truth part two, we're not. We have a problem. In the Old Testament book of Habakkuk, it says that God is so pure, he can't look on evil. I'm going to be involved briefly in Leonard's funeral on Tuesday. And one of the things I anticipate saying is this. Like Leonard, I was a pastor. I started off as a pastor in a retirement area. And in that retirement area, inevitably, I had to conduct lots of funerals. Leonard was a pastor in big churches. Inevitably, Leonard had to conduct lots of funerals. I remember him telling me that one winter season in South Wales, there was a flu epidemic swept through. And in that one winter season alone, Leonard said, I conducted more than 50 funerals. Neither Leonard nor I, nor Leonard himself, we've never been involved in the funeral of a perfect person. Such a person, apart from Jesus, does not exist. We all need to admit that. But the good news is that the God who loved us, God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son, that's Jesus. And Jesus didn't die on that cross for nothing on Good Friday. Jesus was described as being the Lamb of God and he was dying in a context where people knew what it meant for lambs to die. They went to their death as a sacrifice. They were representing the sacrifice which was to come, which was Jesus himself. And when Jesus himself died on Good Friday, he was the Lamb of God. And as John the Baptist had said early on, he was bearing away the sins of us all. Jesus died. 
taking our sin, dealing with the sin, dealing with the problem. You see Isaiah 59 verse 2 says there's a barrier between us and God. We're separated by our iniquities, by our wrongdoings, by our sin, by our wrongful nature. And all that muck and mess and wrongness as Jesus died was placed on him instead of on us. God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son. What do we have to do about it? There is one sense, a practical sense, in which we can't do anything. But there's another one thing we've got to do. And it's this. God loved the world so much he gave his only son that whoever believes on him shall not perish, but will have life without end. To depend on, to rely on, to totally trust in, to follow, to open our hearts to Jesus, and to say, Jesus, no longer am I going to live for myself, I want, I want to live for you. And if we do that, God says, look, present, I give you this present, it's eternal life. Life without limits, life without end. George Verba died Friday. Leonard died a few weeks ago now. My cousin Janet died. I believe on each occasion because they had trusted in Jesus and only in Jesus. I believe that angels came from God right to their bedside. Mm. Fabulous sat nav angels must have. Right to their bedside. George is in West Wickham up there near London and just received them and speedily and safely took them to the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Brilliant. Because they believed in Jesus. That's the good news. Have you done it? I mean, there's no point in being good news for other people, is it? Have you believed in Jesus? And you know in your heart you can say, I'll do it now. I'll start now. I'll get going now. Or maybe you want to say something else, first of all. <laughs> we live in this kind of age, and I don't think it's a, it's a wrong question. You may want to say, what's in it for me? Huh? <laughs> what am I going to get out of this? Well, that's what I'm going to talk about. The good news is good. You're going to get a lot out of it. It's really good, good news. That's what Paul's talking about here. He opened, as I said, when we read and in the first couple of chapters, or at the very beginning, he said, look, I'm not ashamed of the good news. I want to tell you about it. And then he goes on and he says, quite simply, in simple terms, I mean, Paul manages to make it quite different. <laughs> Basically what he's saying is the world is a mess. I, I feel that way these days. It's been a depressing few years, I find. I just look on the news and it's mess, mess, mess. And as I wait for the news tomorrow, I'm not sure whether I'm going to watch it or not. I, there have been times when I've decided not to watch it because I do not have a prophetic gift. But I have thought to myself, when I switch on the news today, it's going to be telling me the world's in a mess. So I've just not watched it. There it is. I, I'm not one to bury my head in the sand. I can't do that for more than two or three days. Then I have to go back and watch it again and get depressed again. And that's what Paul's saying. Morally, in all kinds of ways, the world is in a mess. But then we come to those lovely two verses in chapter 3 and, and verse 21. Those two words, but now. The words, world's in a mess. But now. And he's saying, but now I, I want to tell you about Jesus and what he's done. <clears throat> Wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That's what I want to tell you about. Uh, and he says here, as he opens in chapter 5 and verse 1, therefore since we have been justified by faith. Since we've been justified. Oh, you say, I've lost you already. I agree. It is a kind of technical terminology. But it's jolly good news. Let me unpack it for you. What does it mean that we have been justified by faith? If we've believed in Jesus, part one of the good news, we've been justified by faith. Let me unpack that for you. What, what does it mean? This, it's a real benefit, benefit one. It 
means simply that when God looks at us, he sees us as good. Do you remember Job 25 verse 6? Man is but a maggot. He's only a worm. If you trust Jesus, as soon as you trusted Jesus, God views you as good. I suspect that before we trusted Jesus there were times when we might even have made God cry. He was so sad about us. But actually now God views us as good. How come? How come? Let me give you a couple of Bible verses that kind of fill this out for us. When we trust in Jesus, Ephesians 4 and verse 24 well, that verse tells us that we have put on the new self. We're different. We have to understand this. Alan Redpath, a great preacher, he used to say these words. We are not in the self-improvement business. We are in the Christ replacement business. It's not a matter of me pulling myself up by my bootstrings, improving myself all the time. It's not down to that at all. But I have put on a new self when I trusted in Jesus. Even better than that, Galatians 3.27 says, we have been clothed with Christ. When God looks at somebody who has believed in Jesus, God no longer sees that person as they were, but he sees Jesus in them. They are clothed with Jesus. They are clothed with his goodness. They are clothed with his righteousness. It's as if my record in heaven, at one time it had the name John Bishop on it, but somebody's come along with a lovely holy rubber and rubbed out John Bishop and has put instead the name Jesus Christ. And if anybody wants to go prowling around heaven looking for the sin that I've done in my life, and you find my record... I'm pleased to be able to tell you, you're not going to find my name, you're going to find Jesus Christ's name there too. I've been clothed with Jesus. It's as if I've died with Jesus, and he's come to life in me. At one time the French were at war, and there was compulsory call-up. They were in a sequence of wars, and they had been called up just a couple of years before, and there was call-up again. Uh, and the call-up people came to one man in his home because he hadn't turned up for the conscription. He hadn't done it. And they turned up to get him and to forcibly take him off. He said, hang on. You can't do it. He said, what do you mean? You can't do it. He said, well, I want you to go back to the town hall. I want you to go and look in the records. I'm dead. I died two years ago. <laughs> they laughed at him. He said, I'm deadly serious. You go and check the records out. And they went back to the town hall and later that day they returned and they said, how have you done that? Because in the records there was a record of his death. He was certified dead. He said, I'll tell you how I've done that. Two years ago when there was another war I was called up. And my best friend came to me and he said, you've got a big family, I'm a single man. I shall go instead of you. That was three years ago as the war was starting, he said. And two years ago, my best friend was shot dead. He only got into there in my place because I gave him all my papers and he had his papers on him, my papers on him when he died. So when they found his corpse, they took the papers and they registered me as dead. I don't have to go to war. Dead men don't. I'm not going. And the men were puzzled and didn't know what to do with this. It is said they took this matter right to the top, which was Napoleon Bonaparte. And Napoleon said, officially, he's dead. We can do nothing about it. We cannot bring him into the army. He's gone. And when God looks at my record, 
it shows that when Jesus died, I died on the cross. And God sees me now clothed in the goodness of Jesus, just as if I'd never sinned. I died. And Jesus lives in me. So, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, God looks at me and sees the goodness of Jesus in me. That's a real benefit. Second benefit, it says here, we have peace with God. Since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God. That's what the Bible verse says. Guardian paper, September 2020. And it said there that mental health cases had already plummeted upwards, gone plummeted. No, you don't plummet up, do you? They've gone up, they've shot up three times in those first months of the year. Why? It wasn't Brexit. It wasn't financial issues. It was jolly old COVID was around at that time. And people were becoming increasingly anxious because of COVID in 2020. You know, I think people have an awareness of God in their hearts. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 says that God has put eternity in the hearts of humanity. God has put eternity in our hearts. There is a God awareness in all of us. And I believe alongside of that God awareness, I think for many people there's a God, a God anxiety. Supposing I do die, supposing there is this God, and supposing I've got to stand before him one day, how, how am I going to come out in the wash? How is it going to work for me? It may not work out so well. And I believe there are some people who sometimes put their head on the pillow at the end of the day and they are frankly worried and anxious and they lack peace with God and they wish that they could have it. Paul says, look, that's a benefit of the good news. If you've trusted in Jesus, first of all, God views us as good and secondly, we have peace with God. There's an old book there, Peace with God by Billy Graham. He wrote that book in 1953. Peace with God. Hardly a subtle title, is it? It rapidly became a New York Times bestseller. Billy Graham has died some years ago now. It still sells. It's gone into more than 2 million copies in 38 languages. What's so attractive about it? The title, I think, I believe that people want peace with God. And if we've trusted in Jesus, God sees us as good and we have peace with God. Third benefit of trusting in Jesus, the good news, God gives us good things that we don't deserve. Long verse here, therefore since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. What does grace mean? Grace simply means when we get good things that we don't deserve. I don't move in these circles, but I understand that in the royal circle there are what are called grace and favour apartments. They have them in the royal palaces. They have them at Hampton Court. They have them at Windsor. They have them at Balmoral and places like that. Grace and favour apartments. They are apartments, posh up market apartments, in which the king, in, in the case now, it used to be the queen, can allow people to live at a very moderate rate. They don't deserve it but they're given it as a gift, as a good thing that they don't deserve. Grace and favour apartments. That's what grace is, giving us good things we don't deserve. God is almost certainly not going to give you a free apartment. But John 14, 2, Jesus said, in my Father's house, there's many mansions. And as soon as the newer translations started coming out, it made me mad. <coughs> because it says in the newer translations, in my father's house there's many rooms. I'd rather have a mansion, wouldn't you? It basically means dwell in places. I think big. I'm going for a mansion. But I don't deserve it. 
but it's what God, in his goodness, it's not something I deserve at all. But it's a gift of God's grace. Friday, two or three days ago, George Verver changed address from Glebe Way, 52 Glebe Way, West Wickham, to his mansion with the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless him. Leonard, hopeless at housework, probably better if he had rooms, actually. But he's got this eternal home. My cousin Janet lived in an old-fashioned old farmhouse. She won't know herself now. She's with the Lord in a lovely mansion. If we've trusted Jesus, we've got that assurance. It's going to be okay. Whatever happens to us, there's a heavenly home waiting for us. God views us as good. Two, we have peace with God. Three, God gives us good things we don't deserve. Four, in God we have hope, whatever takes place. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. <coughs> and hope does not disappoint us. A woman worked as a hospital teacher. Hospital teacher. I don't mean that she was teaching the nurses, not that sort of teacher. Teaching school children. And schools would phone her up and say, we've got one of our children in your children's ward. Do you think you could go and help them whilst they're in with their teaching? They, they need your help. She had a call one day. One of our boys is in Ward 4, Children's Ward. Do you think, please, you could go and help him with his adverbs and nouns? And that was the sum and substance of the message. It was left on the answer phone, so that was all they could say. Nothing had prepared that nurse for what she would find in the children's ward. For what she found was a little boy severely burned and very depressed. She went and sat by him and she thought to herself, what do I do with a little boy in this state, severely burned and very depressed? What do I do? What do I do? She said, I think I'll do what they told me to do. I'll help him with his adverbs and nouns. And that's what she did. Two days later, the nurse in charge of Ward 4 phoned down to the hospital school department and spoke to her and said, what do you do to our boy? I taught him adverbs and, and nouns, thinking she was about to get a flea in her ear. And the nurse said, you're brilliant. As Soon as you'd walked out, we could see he'd turned the corner for the better. And he's improving day by day, and he's going to leave home before too long. And as he left the hospital, somebody said, what helped you so much that you recovered so quickly? And he said, I thought I was dying. But then teacher came and taught me adverbs and nouns. And I thought, they don't send you anybody to teach you adverbs and nouns if you're dying. So I decided I was going to live. It gave him hope. Do you remember the lockdowns? In those times, some of us felt pretty hopeless. Pretty hopeless. Where is it going? What's going to happen? And the Bible says one of the benefits of the good news is that we in this world which sometimes feels so hopeless, God gives us hope. Fifth benefit, it's a reminder that God really does love us. And the proof is the cross. Verse 5, hope does not put us to shame because God's love <coughs> has been poured out into our hearts. And the emphasis there is on the extent of God's love. God's love has not been dripped into our hearts. God's love has not been dribbled into our hearts. God loves you and loves you and loves you. And his love for you is poured out into your hearts. And if you want any proof of that, Romans 5 and verse 8 says these famous words. Namely, God proved his love for us in that whilst we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you ever doubt that God loved you, 
think of the cross. In your mind, go to Calvary. Come and see, come and see, come and see the King of Love. See him on that cross. And look into his face. He'll not be angry with you. I think if you do that in your mind, you would be overwhelmed with God's love for you. A little boy was taken by his mum to a Good Friday service. And the preacher that day, it being Good Friday, was talking about the cross and doing it very well. Frankly, sometimes we pussyfoot around these things. I know it was the most horrendous form of execution that you could imagine. I know that. And not surprisingly, the little boy was weeping. He was crying. And his mum reached across to him. I understand where she was coming from, but I think she made a mistake. She said to her little boy, don't take it too seriously. <laughs> Don't take it too seriously. Like I say, I understand where she was coming from, but what worries me most is I sometimes think that some of us go to Calvary, maybe on Good Friday, maybe at communion, whenever. And it's just as if somebody has whispered to us and we've heard him and we're taking their advice. Don't take it too seriously. I think we should. I believe we should. I'm sure we should. Take it seriously. I'll be honest with you, I, I wish I wept more at communion. I wish I wept more at Easter. That's God proving how much he loves me. And my mindset says, don't take it too seriously. I should. I really should. <clears throat> September 1860, in Lake Michigan, over in the United States-Canada border, Lady Elgin was a side paddle steamer, and she was round. That part of the world, summer is very short. The waters were icy cold. That night, more than 300 people died in the water. 114 were saved. Of those 114 who were saved, seven of them were rescued by one young man who was a student in a nearby Bible college. His name was Edward Spencer, and he was studying at Garrett Bible Institute. He saved 17 people, wading out into the ice-cold waters. After he'd saved the 17th, he collapsed on the shore. The bottom half of his body was numb. He did live a long life, but from there on he was paralyzed from the waist down, and he had to live in a wheelchair. And on his 80th birthday, someone said to him, when you think of that dreadful night, when you were just a young man and you saved those 17 people, what do you think of most? And he said, what I think of most is this. I saved 17 people and not one of them said thank you. I see his point. The Lord Jesus Christ gave his life for us. God proved his love for us. And we just leave it at that. And we treat it so lightly. We do not take it seriously. <clears throat> I believe that we should. One more benefit that I want to bring to you out of these verses. Got up to number five. And here's number six. God is with us always. And God's Holy Spirit has come into our lives to stay. As I was, you know, in my whatever I was, I can't remember, I can't do the something. But I'll tell you, it was the 1970s. I expect you're surprised I was born at that point. <laughs> in the 1970s, there was an awful lot of unhappiness in the church. There was an awful lot of squabbling going on. 
It must have made God so sad. It was about the Holy Spirit. And people were saying to one another, you haven't got the Spirit of God. You haven't got the Holy Spirit. You need something more. And they were inferring, I have got the Holy Spirit, but you haven't. What's the truth of this? Well, Paul says here, he speaks of the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. In Romans 1 and verse 7, he, he's starting off writing to this people and he's writing to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people. All of you. He's not saying, I'm, I, I'm, I'm just writing to the Reformed Christians in Rome. He's not saying, I'm writing to the Pentecostals in Rome or the Charismatics in Rome. You know, one of the wonderful things about George Verber, who's just died, he has touched thousands of lives. And somehow he managed to steer through life avoiding controversy. I was a real gift. And that's to be admired. He didn't get tangled up in these things. And Paul here is saying, I'm writing to you all. And then he comes into verse chapter 5 and the end of verse 5, and he speaks there of the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Do you see what he's saying? He's basically saying, when you believed in Jesus, when you trusted in Jesus, at that moment, God came into your life in the person of the Holy Spirit and he resides in you and he lives in you. He, he put it elsewhere. God's Spirit lives in you, he said in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 16. And again, no brackets as long as you're of this denomination or whatever. No, 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 no. If you trusted in Jesus, God's Spirit lives in you. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, the Holy Spirit who is in you. Here we are. Says it again. And he is the last one, the Holy Spirit who lives in us, 2 Timothy 1.14. I don't know if you were ever aware of this, but what a benefit. The time you trusted in Christ, and I talked about it being a moment, research suggests that for two-thirds of the people who become Christians, it happens over a period of time, not in an instant. You know, sometimes we call people to a decision. What was your moment? And people get very embarrassed and say, well, I don't have a moment, but I know I am. And we almost seem to want to say to them, well, you need a moment. No, you don't. You need Jesus. I don't mind the date. I don't mind the time. And it might have taken quite a while for it to happen. But whenever it did happen, and probably at a time only known to God himself, whenever it happened, if you can now say, once I was blind and now I can see, once I didn't believe, now I do believe. You will know for sure, according to these scriptures, that God himself in the person of the Holy Spirit came to live in you. I reckon that's a pretty fair dinkum benefit. Pretty good, if you ask me. The good news is good. It really is. Let's just remind ourselves. The good news is good. Romans 5, from verse 1 onwards, is saying, God views us to, as good. We're justified by faith. We have peace with God. God gives us good things we don't deserve. In God, we have hope, whatever takes place. God really does love us, and the proof is the cross. God's with us always. God, Holy Spirit, comes in to stay. Okay. Maybe there's someone here that's still saying, you were right in the beginning. I still feel a maggot. I still feel a worm. Can I just say, I have learned in life that sometimes I have to let the facts stand as stronger than my feelings. Sometimes I have to really work hard to ignore, to turn my back on my feelings. One of the things that the great American evangelist Billy Graham was renowned for saying in his preaching was the little words, the Bible says. The Bible says. And you know that old children's song that ends up with the refrain, 
the Bible tells me so. And sometimes we need to yeah, turn our back on the feelings and say, I'm going to opt for the facts. Lisa and I met at Bible College, and our principal at that time was a dear man. He'd been a tremendous missionary in Nigeria, doing great things. Every so often in the Bible College, he would disappear for a little while, and the staff would cover for him. And what emerged was he was a man who wrestled with deep depression. Eventually he retired, and actually he came to live down here in the West Country, in Bristol. Finally died, and I went to his funeral. And it was conducted by a minister who was one of his relatives, and said, David told me many times, I know that God loves me, but I've never felt it. And David did so much for God in mission field and leading the Bible college. And yet such was his psychological, his, his mental condition, that he would say all through his life, I know that God loves me, but I've never felt it. And maybe that's your disposition. The fact is, God does love you. God does love me, whether we feel it or not. He loves us. In medieval times, monasteries served as hospitals. And one day, one of the monks decided to let us go to the next town. So he left the monastery and he went walking to the next town. En route, he was mugged and viciously beaten up, left on the side of the road to die as far as they were concerned. Thankfully, some people found him and did what you did in those days, namely, took him back to the monastery. Not because it was obvious that he was a monk, because it wasn't. He was so beaten up and so disfigured and his clothes had been ripped off him and thrown away you couldn't tell he was a monk. And so this broken, disfigured, injured, badly injured man was taken back to the monastery. And some of the monks who did the medical work came into the room and examined him and washed him. And they looked down in perfect Latin, they said these words, we'll leave that worm until tomorrow and see what happens. They didn't realize he was one of their own. They should have recognized him, but he was just too beaten up. We'll leave that worm until tomorrow and see what happens. And he, in perfect Latin, responded and said to them, <laughs> For such a worm as this, my Lord did choose to die. <laughs> For such a worm as this, my Lord did choose to die. Are you feeling maggoty, wormy? Listen, for such a worm as you, that's the fact. My Lord did choose to die. God proves his love for us. In that whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The hymn writer says this, Alas, did my Saviour bleed? Did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Resounding answer, yes he would. And yes he did. He loved you that much. The good news very, very good. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you that you gave your only Son. We thank you for Jesus, for his birth, for his life, for his ministry, and that ultimate proof of your love for us in that he died on the cross. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus. And we can trust you because you proved that you were God when on the third day you rose again. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you loved us so much. Thank you that the good news is good, that God views us as good, that we have peace with God, that God gives us good things we don't deserve, that in God we have hope, whatever takes place, and that God really does love us. And the proof is the cross. That's good news. And we thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We're going to sing in your hymn books 228. 228. And it's those words that were on the screen just now that I read out to you. Alas, and did my Savior bleed? Did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Was it for crimes that I'd done that he groaned upon the tree? <laughs> Amazing pity grace unknown, and love beyond degree. 228, let's stand to sing.